It's a pretty good trip, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think Gregory and his team have done a fantastic job. Yes. Uh, okay, so we had some discussion in the bus about Gnosticism and duality, and I'm going to give a talk related to that theme tonight. Uh, it's possible one or two people in this room may have heard this talk or a version of this talk, in which case I hope it'll be like watching a good movie again. Yes, sure. um, but uh, there's a lot of material to get through, and it's very complexly interrelated, and you may not see where I'm going with it at first. Uh, but the background to the talk... Um, would be found in these three books, which is Supernatural, uh, The Master Game, which used to be called Talisman. It's been renamed as The Master Game that I wrote with Robert Bobal, And my novel, Entangled, uh, also concerns the themes of this, of this talk. And I touched on some of these themes in my, in my TED talk as well, which I got into trouble for. Uh, so that, I would say, is obvi obviously a question that uh, everybody in this room has asked themselves at some point or another. Uh, and frankly speaking, as I passed into my 60s, I find myself asking this question more often than I used to ask when I was immortal in my 20s. <laughs> um, and the truth is, no, nobody knows, you know. We can have, we can have our, our faith, we can have beliefs, but we really don't have any, any facts. Our, our, our beliefs may take the form of facts in our mind. We may be absolutely confident on the answer to the question, or we may be in great doubt on the answer to the question. But the question is there, and in a sense, the question of what happens to us when we die is also a question about what is the purpose of our lives, if indeed there is any purpose to, to our lives. And there are some who hold that there is no purpose to life, and that nothing happens, we just gone when we're dead. And that that's the, the, end of the end of the story. Like Richard Dawkins, uh, who is the, um, uh, was, was formerly the professor for the public understanding of science at Oxford University. Very famous man, I have met Richard Dawkins. He's an um, extremely eloquent speaker, uh, very um, effective, arguer, very persuasive, and he has an enormous following. Um, he's famous for his book, a recent book, The God Delusion, but actually what put him on the map, he's a geneticist, and what put him on the map was The Selfish Gene, uh, published uh, some decades ago, uh, which, which argues that we are, our bodies are simply vehicles for servicing our genes. And uh, Dawkins is uh, strongly opposed to any sort of mystical ideas. And um, he belongs to that faction of materialist scientists who call the kind of ideas that a lot of us in this room entertain, they, they call those ideas woo-woo. <laughs> and um, they laugh at us for holding, for holding those ideas. Uh, but I would say that there's a strong element of woo-woo in Dawkins' ideas as well. Um, for, for, for example, when, when he says that, as he does in this, in this quotation, I, of course I, I agree with him that we should all live our lives to the full. Definitely, this is an incredible gift that we've been given in the form of life. And uh, absolutely we should live our lives to the full, and what a waste if we don't. But then to say because there is nothing after it, that is a bridge too far for me. Uh, that is woo-woo, actually. That is a scientific fairy tale. When a, when a scientist says that there is no life after death, that's not a fact. That's not based on experimentation or measurement or any empirical inquiry, as a matter of fact. That, that is a statement of Richard Dawkins' own particular faith. It's a belief system. It's, uh, it's a, as lacking in evidence to not believe in life after death as to believe in life after death. And, and his, his statements on these matter have no more weight than anybody else's statements. But because he is the professor of the public understanding of science at Oxford University and a famous geneticist, many, many millions of people around the world have been taken in to the belief that he is, he is actually telling us some kind of fact here. And uh, I think it's important to be clear that it's not, in any sense, uh, a fact. Death. Uh, because we live in a, 
in a world governed by materialist science, there we work with a materialist definition of death. Everybody's heard of flatlining. We have these machines called the electroencephalographs, which measure brainwave activity. And uh, the legal definition of death is the complete cessation of brain functions as evidenced by the absence of brainwave activity on the electroencephalogram. And the, the problem that I have with that uh, is that um, we are not our brains. We are our consciousness. That's, that's what we are. We all know it in our hearts. Whatever this mysterious thing called consciousness is, that is what we are. And the question then arises, what is the relationship between the brain and consciousness? And all we can actually say is that the brain is definitely involved in consciousness in some way. There are, by the way, a huge number of neurons in the human gut. Next to the brain, the gut has the, the, the most amount of neurons in the, in the human body. It's not an accident that we speak of a gut feeling. And there's very interesting uh, issues where people have had, for example, heart transplants, and um, where they start to acquire the memories or thoughts of the person whose heart they have received. How do we, how do we explain that if the, if the brain is the sole locus of, of consciousness? There's, there's some, something, something going on there. So we can say that the brain is definitely involved in consciousness. Most, in most cases, when, when scientists uh, use the reductionist model of consciousness, they say, look, if I damage your brain, a particular area of your brain, a particular area of your consciousness will go out, it won't function anymore, or it won't function well. And that therefore proves that the brain makes consciousness. And this is the, the, the materialist model, that the brain is a generator of consciousness. And that, and that is the model that most of us unthinkingly are required to adopt by, by our society. That the brain is a, a generator or a manufacturer of consciousness. And what is used to underpin that is the notion that if you damage the brain, areas of consciousness are compromised. But the same would be true if this other model applied. If the relationship of the brain to consciousness was more like the relationship of the TV signal and the TV set, there, there too, if you damage the TV set, of course the picture will be impaired. You will not receive a good picture anymore. But the signal remains intact. And so the other possibility is that consciousness is more like, I'm using an analogy, I'm not saying consciousness is a signal, but I'm saying it's more like a signal and its relationship that it manifests or it's expressed or it, or it comes into appearance through the TV set, rather than it is something made by the TV set. We know as a matter of fact that the TV pictures are not made by the TV set. They are, they are the product of the TV signal. And this, is, of course, is the paradigm of all spiritual traditions, that, um, that we are souls incarnated in bodies, that the soul is primary, uh, that we are souls who have a body, not bodies who have a soul, uh, and that uh, the soul incarnates in body for a particular purpose uh, is, is held true by, by many religions. And actually, this whole issue of death and life after death, I think if we just stand back and, and view it reasonably, we have to say it's a 50-50 it's a shot. We don't know. Could be we survive death, that consciousness survives death in some way. Of course, that's impossible if you believe that the brain is the sole generator of consciousness. But if you can step back from that model and consider other possibilities, then yes, we could survive death. Or maybe we don't. Maybe we are just meat robots. And there is no soul, there is no consciousness at all. But then we have this whole range of uh, extraordinary human experiences. I had one myself at the age of 16, which I've come to realize, actually I was 17, I've come to realize has, um, 
uh, had a profound effect on the whole rest of my life, although at that time I didn't particularly register it as such. Uh, and that was that I had a, a, a massive, um, near-fatal electric shock at the age of 17. Um, I was washing the uh, dishes in my home, and I was barefoot, and I was standing in a puddle of water, and, and because I'm slightly OCD, I got this impulse to check that the fridge was properly plugged in. And, uh, and I reached out, standing in a pool of water with my wet hands, and the back was off the plug. And I, I received an absolutely searing, devastating electric shock, and I was thrown across the kitchen, hit the wall on the other side, slid down to the floor, and I was out of my body. Uh, and that, that's why I just don't have any doubt about out-of-body experiences, because I had one. I was there, I was up around the light, I looked down on myself, and I thought, I was pretty detached, I wasn't afraid, I thought, hmm, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then I went back in, I didn't do the full near-death experience at all, I didn't meet deceased relatives, I wasn't told to go back, I didn't go through a tunnel of light, but I was out of my body, for sure, and I could see my body on the ground. Um, and that cannot be explained by the, the mainstream the mainstream kind of near-death experiences are very hard to explain and, and, and also convincing evidence of reincarnation um, and here I would cite the work of Ian Stevens at the University of Virginia uh, very solid academic work he went into the project determined to disprove reincarnation and after 15 years he ended up proving reincarnation uh, or at least as far as he was concerned as a, as a a mainstream scientist, the evidence that he compiled from conducting interviews with people all over the world who had experiences of reincarnation could only be explained by the fact that they had actually been reincarnated, that they could identify particular objects in places where they had lived in their previous lives that they couldn't possibly have known. There was a huge amount of evidence. So that doesn't make sense if the brain is just uniquely the generator of consciousness and our soul is, is a figment of our imagination. And indeed, if the brain, if consciousness is, as these materialist scientists like to say, an epiphenomenon of brain activity, in other words, we have these sophisticated brains in order to survive in the jungle of life. We've evolved these sophisticated brains uh, as a survival mechanism, and it's an accidental byproduct of that that we have this thing called consciousness. That, believe it or not, is the mainstream view of consciousness. So I don't think that materialist scientists are the people to ask about the mystery of life after death. Not, um, simply because they have nothing to say on the matter. They, they just say there is no life after death. Can't be, because we're just bodies. Uh, I think the people to ask are, uh, amongst others, people like the ancient Egyptians, who really thought about this problem and devoted their culture to considering the problem of how we lead our lives and what is the meaning of death? Uh, it's, they, they did not have a morbid fascination with death. They had um, an inquiry into the mystery of reality. And that inquiry went on for a very, very, very long time. Egyptian civilization pursued that inquiry for 3,000 years. And they put their best people on that uh, to think about that. And they came to, they came to certain uh, conclusions. And they expressed those conclusions in extraordinary uh, symbolic art. And, and what we see here, this is from the pharaoh Seti I at Abydos in Upper Egypt. What we see is the goddess Isis feeding Ankh, uh, feeding immortal life uh, to the pharaoh Seti I. Uh, the sense is that immortality is something that can be striven for or uh, attained and, and ultimately granted by the gods. Um, and and uh, here, the story of Osiris, this is, this is um, one of the fundamental myths and traditions of ancient Egypt, that uh, Osiris is the god of the first time. He rules in Zeptepi when the gods uh, walked on earth. Uh, and he is um, the founder of the system that becomes Egypt. He, he creates this beautiful, harmonious, balanced kingdom in, in line with the laws of Mart of celestial harmony, but he there is envy and jealousy from his rival Set, and Set kills Osiris, and he he murders him, and his body is cut into into pieces. And uh, Isis, uh, the consort of Osiris, 
uh, reassembles those pieces of the body of Osiris. And she takes the form of a bird. In some of the traditions, it's a swallow, and in others, as here, it's a, it's a kite. And she hovers over the phallus of Osiris, and she receives his seed and gives birth to the divine child Horus, who renews the line. So every Egyptian pharaoh was the Horus king, and he aspired to become, after his death, an Osiris uh, in, the, in, in the heavens. Um, the serpent eating its own tail is a reference to the eternity of, of time that we see, the Arubaro serpent that we see on the, the second shrine of the tomb, Tutankhamun. And sorry, the reproduction in here isn't that great, but I love this image also on the second shrine of the tomb, tomb of Tutankhamun, where the, um, the initiate is receiving through the third eye, through the pineal gland, uh, the rays of, uh, of these stars up in the heavens. It's as though there's some, uh, th there's a recognition of the role of the pineal gland of the third eye uh, in this process of immortality. Uh, and here, uh, Sartre shot this as a, as a double exposure. Uh, the tomb of Unas, fifth dynasty pharaoh at Saqqara in Upper Egypt inside the Pyramid of Unas. And behind, on the other exposure, the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And, and in a way, this, this makes a very important point, because the Great Pyramid itself is mute. There are no texts inside the Great Pyramid. There are, there are these disputed hieroglyphs in the so-called quarry marks, in the relieving chambers, above the king's chamber. But otherwise, there are no texts at all. The monument must speak for itself purely in terms of its architecture and its effects upon consciousness. But here in the fifth dynasty, we get these incredibly complex texts, the so-called pyramid texts, and these starry ceilings begin to appear. There's always this connection with the heavens uh, in ancient Egyptian religion. And these are the pyramid texts written on the wall, the earliest pyramid texts written on the wall of the pyramid of Unas at Saqqara in Upper Egypt. And that's what the pyramid texts look like, and indeed that is the name of Unas there. Uh, and again, stars uh, feature, feature prominently in the, uh, in the ideas that are, that are contained in the pyramid texts. And they're part of an extraordinary body of literature. We're all familiar with the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. Everybody's heard of that. And it was called the Book of the Dead because it was written on papyrus scrolls, usually placed inside the mummy. Uh, when, when the body was mummified. Um, earlier than the, the Book of the Dead, we have the Book of what is in the Duat. The Duat was the celestial afterlife kingdom through which the soul, it was believed that the soul must make a perilous journey after death. And what we need to do with life is prepare for that journey. Coffin texts are earlier still. They were written on the lids of coffins to be visible to the mummy. And oldest of all are the, are the pyramid texts. But essentially, the message of all of these texts is the same. They're all one liturgy, just repromulgated in different, in different periods. And they seek to prepare us for our journey through the Duat. And in that sense, they bear a lot of comparison with the Tibetan Book of the Dead, which also seeks to prepare us for the journey through the, through the Bardo, through the between. Uh, where our souls pass time uh, before returning to incarnation. And, and uh, this duat place in the ancient Egyptian uh, symbolism is really very interesting because on one level it is definitely a region of the sky and we can identify that region of the sky quite specifically as falling between Orion and Leo uh, in the heavens and I'll show a diagram related to that. But it's also, it also has a physical aspect, like it's a three-dimensional system of corridors and passageways, <coughs> often with gates. And at those gates, we're going to be asked questions, and we're going to be tested by monstrous, sometimes monstrous entities. And uh, we must be prepared for all of that. We must be prepared for everything we encounter on the journey through the Duat, because if we enter the Duat bewildered, afraid, um, surprised, as Richard Dawkins might indeed be, uh, <laughs> the the then uh, we're going to have a hard time there, and we will not secure our next incarnation in the way that we might wish. The relationship of the pyramids to stars, 
uh, quite apart from the fact that you can't align monuments of this scale in the, with the precision that they're aligned without using astronomy, uh, I think it's visible to the naked eye, and it was my friend Robert Bobal who really nailed it down with his Orion correlation theory back in the early 90s. And Robert and I worked together on Keeper of Genesis called The Message of the Sphinx, and I showed this diagram the other night. Um, but the, in the texts, there's a mysterious reference to the duat, to, to what is called the hidden circle of the duat. And what we considered was the possibility that the duat, which is a, this very identifiable region of the sky with the celestial, the winding waterway, the celestial river <laughs> running through it, uh, that, that what we considered was that the hidden circle meant that it was hidden in time. That they spoke of it in the date that we call 2500 BC, uh, but, they were, but it was actually hidden in a time 8,000 years earlier. And that you had to have uh, knowledge of that phenomenon that I referred to the other night called precession. You had to be able to wind the skies back in your mind to, to find the duat, and the, the, the hidden circle of the duat. And this is, the, this is that mysterious realm that we find on the spring equinox, which is, what is it today, 20th of March? Yeah. So 20th, 21st of March, we have the spring equinox mm -hmm. in the, tomorrow, when the sun rises perfectly due east and night and day are of equal length heaven and earth join. So that's, what, that's what's happening here. Nile, Nile, winding waterway, Orion, pyramid, Sphinx, Leo. This is the hidden circle of the Duat. Uh, the suggestion that we must be initiated into these mysteries, that that's part of the purpose of, purpose of life. I just want to take a slight excursion to take you around the Giza Plateau. Um, and to make the point that I don't think the pyramid, the Great Pyramid in particular, can be understood without reference to those texts. I don't think the texts can be understood without reference to the Great Pyramid. And that all of them are... I don't know whether the Great Pyramid is also a power plant. My friend Chris Dunn, who I've known for many, many years and, and, and loved dearly and have worked with for a very long time, is convinced the Great Pyramid is a, is a power plant. And he's a, he's a machine tool maker and he has very great knowledge of, of these things. Maybe it is, but... What I'm sure it is, is an instrument for transforming consciousness. And that it is connected uh, to an ancient science of, uh, of immortality. It may have many, many other functions as well. But if we want to regard the Giza pyramid as a machine for generating power, we shouldn't forget its sacred functions as well. Because uh, ultimately that is, that is what it's all about. And there it is, 6 million tons, 2.3 million blocks, um, 52 degree angle of slope. And as I always point out when I give this talk, that is the corner that you want to climb uh, if you're going to climb the Great Pyramid illegally. Um, or legally, come to that. Uh, because the southwest corner uh, has the most perfect line uh, and it's most easy to follow up to the top of this uh, 481 foot uh, monument. And uh, the Great Pyramid's tower over the city of Cairo today, dwarfing all modern architecture. And this is a view from the site that took from an Egyptian military helicopter hovering over the East Plateau. This is the village of Nazlet al Saman. And here is the Great Sphinx, just here, looking due east across the Nile Valley. And there's uh, Khufu, Kafre, and Menkara. I don't think they were made by Khufu, Kafre, and Menkara, by the way, but uh, I don't know who they were made by, but they're conventionally attributed to three pharaohs of the fourth dynasty. It, it, I mean, this, if this was Khufu to be his tomb, which in my view is a nonsensical idea, then it was built in 20 years during his <coughs> reign. You get into stunning calculations of how many blocks per minute had to be moved in order to complete the six million. It just, just defies belief. As we fly around to the west side, uh, we see again the three, the three great pyramids. Here are the tombs of the nobles. There was a, there was a, a sacred a sanctity attached to the site, and naturally people did wish to be buried close to this sacred place. Um, and, and that adds to the notion that it's a necropolis, but I don't believe for a moment that the function of the Great Pyramids themselves was to do with the burial of any uh, 
uh, of any pharaoh. And there again is the Sphinx, 270 feet long, 70 feet high, looking out across the Nile Valley. And uh, coming closer, we're looking at the northern faces of the three great pyramids here, where their true entrances are. And closer still, you can see that there's half a course of masonry on the south side at the top of the Great Pyramid. Uh, and there is, in fact, a wooden structure on top of there, as, as you were asking me earlier, uh, which measures the original height of the Great Pyramid. But um, for some reason, I don't know, we're not getting enough light through this projector or something. It's not showing the, the details sufficiently. Um, because the pyramid is not complete. We don't know if it was ever complete. Was it complete? Did it have its ben ben? Were, were these corners brought up to a point as they are in the Pyramid of Khafra, or um, was it never completed, or did it fall off during the earthquake of 1301? It's difficult to, it's difficult to be sure. Um, and and uh, then finally, me, on top of the Great Pyramid, some years ago, <laughs> quite a few years ago actually, um, I, I climbed the Great Pyramid five times. And uh, it's an amazing, it's an amazing privilege to be up there. I compared it in fingerprints of the gods to a magic carpet flying over Cairo. And it's a great place to be in the dawn, to be up there, climbing to the dark, and, 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 and be up there for the heavens just growing <coughs> above you, and, and this sense of this huge sacred energy just rumbling underneath you. I mean. It's not the last surviving wonder of the ancient world for no good reason. It's, it, is, it is the most incredible place on planet Earth. Right? There's just no doubt about it. The Great Pyramid is the place to be. And, uh, and it's a privilege to climb it. It's very, it's, it, it can only be done uh, illegally now. The Egyptian authorities have just climbed down completely on legal lines. But, but fortunately, Egyptians are human and subject to human weakness. And, and money can change hands and the deal can be done. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> how much? <laughs> well, it, cost, it cost me, I mean, the, when, the, the, the one time I really paid, I set out the figures in fingerprints. I forget, I mean, it was, it was probably like a couple of hundred dollars. Oh, it wasn't that much. It would cost you more now. Yeah. Now it's $2,000. Huh? $2,000. No. $2,000 now? Yeah. You yeah. see, that's what happens with inflation. But they are starting from $10,000. They are what? They are starting from 10,000. Oh, they start from 10,000 and count down? Yeah. 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 yeah, I think, I mean, when I, when I first climbed it, which was like 1994, we bribed, we had to bribe, I told the story in Fingerprints of Gods, we bribed the guards in advance and then we bribed them again on the spot. And it was all very tense, but I don't think I ended up paying out more than two or three hundred dollars. Um, it was better then. <laughs> now you pay more. Um, and as I'm, I'm, I'm Again, apologies if you've heard this before, but I found my granddad's graffiti just down there. Yeah. There's lots of graffiti here, and my grandfather's was there. Um, P. Hancock, 5th of April, 1916. And I had my dad check my grandfather's diary, and sure enough, on that date, he says, climb the Great Pyramid today. Oh, so, um, it, it, uh, it means a lot to me. I wonder how much. Uh, so there it is, the Great Pyramid. This amazing enigmatic structure. And here are its innards. There's the subterranean chamber, which is uh, 100 feet vertically beneath the base of the pyramid, um, and close to 600 feet beneath the apex of the pyramid. And it's, uh, it's, it's entered through the true entrance, the true northern entrance to the Great Pyramid, which was closed actually until the 9th century. But at that time the pyramid still had its casing stones and the Arabs couldn't figure out a way in and they, Caliph Mamun started breaking a hole into the, into the pyramid, which is called Mamun's Hole, and that's the entrance that we go through into the pyramid to this day, uh, and uh, eventually exposed the internal corridor system. Uh, this part, of course, is hewn out of solid bedrock. And I believe that the subterranean chamber is the oldest part of the um, I think, as a matter of fact, that's why the pyramid was built there. There is a natural mound inside the Great Pyramid, about 30 feet high. Uh, and, and what we must end, the picture in deep antiquity is a natural mound 
into the side of which was cut this channel and beneath which was excavated this chamber. Uh, and then later the pyramid was built on top of it. I think the subterranean chamber is uh, prehistoric. Uh, and and um, it's the reason, it's the original primeval map why the Great Pyramid was, was built there. That's the subterranean chamber as it looks uh, today. And really the Egyptological theory is laughable, uh, which is that um, this was originally intended to be the tomb of Pharaoh Khufu, um, but that the Egyptians, those, those whimsical ancient Egyptians, having excavated this 300 foot long sloping corridor, which by the way is perfectly straight from top to bottom, and having got down there and started excavating the subterranean chamber, well, they just changed their minds. And they said, no, actually, we won't bury the pharaoh there. We're going to stick him higher up in the pyramid. And they abandoned it. I, I, I think that's a nonsensical idea. I think this is a, this is a fundamental part of the Great Pyramid. It was, it, it was designed and intended as such. I believe these pins of stone themselves play a part in its overall function. It's amazing. Amazing sound effects that you get down there. You can hear somebody chanting in the king's chamber when you're down in the subterranean chamber. Here's how it looked uh, 100 or so years ago. Um, much more spooky than it is today. Um, scary, in a way. And it's interesting to look at these ancient pictures. That's that, that's that corridor, the descending corridor that goes down to the subterranean chamber. And into its side is cut this channel, which leads up through a sort of winding intestine called the well shaft that joins with the main corridor system up here. Quite a feat that to make this connect with that. Um, nobody knows what it's what it's for or what it's all about, really. But if we go on up here, and then we're, we're going to find ourselves in the ascending corridor, going up there. Uh, that's what the ascending corridor looks like. Nice railings now and, and steps. It's still a difficult climb if you've got stiff legs. But uh, as long as you can bend double and eight and walk, it's fine. Um, and that's the junction of the horizontal corridor that goes to the Queen's Chamber and the Grand Gallery that goes on up to the King's Chamber. Uh, and again, if we that's that junction point there where this 19th century photograph shows us today it's very nicely tidied up, but you go along through there and you come into the Queen's Chamber. There's a step in the corridor, nobody knows what that's there for, and finally there is the Queen's Chamber itself. And those, we were talking on the bus about the robotic exploration of the shafts. That's the southern shaft of the Queen's Chamber, which points at the star Sirius. And it points at the star Sirius in 2500 BC, by the way. Uh, at the time that it transits the meridian, which is one of the reasons why we cannot separate the Great Pyramid entirely from the ancient Egyptians, even if we wish to. And as I mentioned on the bus, this was previously closed. There was a blank stone face there until 1872, when the British Freemason Wayman Dixon discovered that the hollow points had knocked them through, and we now know that the shafts are there. And uh, those shafts, in the case of the Queen's Chamber, do not exit on the outside of the pyramid. And there's a whole issue about what they're about. I, whatever they're about, one of the things they're about is a connection to this afterlife uh, system. And there is the Grand Gallery, this amazing cavity inside the Great Pyramid, which is 153 feet long and 28 feet high. And it's what's called a Corbel vault, which is that each, each uh, course slightly overhangs the course below it, uh, producing this, this vaulted uh, effect. And right up there at the top is the antechamber that leads you into the king's chamber. How many here have been to Giza? I bet just about everybody. Yeah. <laughs> we're, all, we're all Giza pilgrims. <laughs> so you know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and there again, it's interesting and instructive to look how people had to get up there uh, in past time. Um, that when there was no, um, you know, aids, no banisters to cling on to, and you work your way up into that gloomy, gloomy darkness, and uh, you would come through from the antechamber into the king's chamber, 
itself. <coughs> One thing human beings have never stopped doing is scrawling graffiti over walls. There's the uh, northern shaft of the king's chamber. That's the only thing the northern shaft of the king's chamber. Um, and here is the king's chamber itself, which is a sort of symphony of geometry. 34 feet, 4 inches from east to west, 17 feet, 2 inches from north to south. It makes it a 2 by 1 rectangle. Uh, it's 19 feet and 1 inch high. It's made of 100 granite blocks. Those granite blocks were brought all the way from Aswan in Upper Egypt. They're from a known quarry. They were brought about 500 miles. Uh, and the ceiling blocks are of the order of 50 to 70 tons each. Here we are, some 300 plus feet above the ground. And they're moving around these giant blocks of, of stone as though they were Lego. Um, to cut a long story short, the ancient name for Giza was Rosta. And the texts make it clear that um, a great secret lay hidden in the fifth division of the Duat, uh, which was referred to in the text as Rosta. So there's a very strong suggestion that Giza uh, is a duat on the ground, and it's a specific part of the duat, it's the fifth division. Uh, it's also called the land of Sokar, and it's from that that we get the name Sakara, by the way. Um, that is the fifth division of the duat on the ground. Uh, and that it has all these features, a sphinx, a sphinx, this is from the tomb of the Moses the third in the Valley of the Kings, the book of what is in the duat, a pyramid, pyramids, uh, you begin to see the, the comparisons that, that what we're looking at is a, is a book of the dead in stone when we look at the monuments of Giza. I don't dispute that they have other functions, but one of the things they are is a simulator for the journey that the soul is going to make after death. The Grand Gallery, depicted in the book of what is in the Duat. The boats that we see for navigating through the Duat. We find boats buried beside the Great Pyramid, one of them fully reassembled now in the Boat Museum. Uh, all these narrow corridors and, and passageways. Um, it's, it's as though they brought the Duat down to earth and made a model of it to give us, so that we may have knowledge of that hidden circle of the Duat. And here, a lot of people, and I myself, wonder what really is the function of the King's Chamber. Certainly not for burial of the King. Uh, nothing to do with nothing to do with that. No evidence at all that any pharaoh was ever buried inside the king's chamber. The king's chamber was built around this sarcophagus. Uh, the sarcophagus is too big to bring through the antechamber into the king's chamber. Um, the fact that there's a sarcophagus in it is the simplistic notion that leads Egyptologists to conclude it is the tomb chamber of, pharaoh, of a pharaoh. But a sarcophagus can be used for ritual functions as well. In fact, a sarcophagus is used for ritual functions in Freemasonry to, to this day. So uh, maybe some ritual function was, was involved in that sarcophagus. At any rate, in the fifth division of the Duat, this encounter occurs. It's called the Way of the Soul. Um, and it takes place in the Judgment Hall of Osiris, which is also called the Hall of the Double Mart. And very frequently, it's approached up the sloping corridor or rather like that. So I'm wondering whether that's what the King's Chamber is. It's, the, it's this central moment in the journey through the Duat. Uh, the moment that our entire life has been our opportunity to prepare for. I, I'm very touched and, and moved by the way the ancient Egyptians look at the, at the mystery of life and death. Uh, but they, f f first of all, these little fellows up here, these are the negative assessors in the Judgment Hall of Osiris. They are going to ask you questions. Did you kill? Did you steal? Did you take the name of the gods in vain? And actually all of the Ten Commandments, and 32 others as well, are going to ask you those questions, and ideally you should be able to answer, no, I didn't kill. No, I didn't steal. You're supposed to not have done those things. Um, but the ancient Egyptians, indeed like the modern Egyptians, have a very forgiving understanding of human frailty. They understand that we are weak, that we cannot all be perfect. And life is seen as our opportunity to iron out our imperfections. Uh, indeed, the human life was seen rather like a, a work of art. 
that a sculptor might engage with for a very long period of time, a whole lifetime of sculpture. Chipping away here, make a little mistake every now and then, fix it, work around it, improve it, until at the end of your project, at the end of your 70 or 80 or 90 or however many years you get, you look at your work of art, which is your life, and, and, and you can honestly say, I did good. That would be the ideal thing. You don't, have to do, you don't have to just be this perfect paragon of virtue all the time. You will make mistakes, but the point is to correct those mistakes. This is very clear in the ancient Egyptian tradition. So the moral aspect of the judgment scene um, is uh, mor moral behavior is, is kind of necessary but not sufficient for what is going on here. There's something else going on as well. This is the goddess Mart. She wears the feather of Mart, cosmic justice, truth, harmony on her headdress. And uh, this notion of harmony with the universe is also very central to what's going on. And here is the way of the heart. This symbolizes the heart or the soul of the deceased. And here is the feather of Mart. And what you don't want is for your heart to be heavy in the scales and to overweigh the feather. You want a balance. You want to have lived a life that produces balance at the end of the day. Uh, some, some kind of harmony has been, uh, has, has been achieved. Um, and that involves all the choices that we make in our lives. Every minute of every day we're making choices. And those choices define the life that we've led. And if we have um, impinged upon the sovereignty of others, if we have added to the stock of misery in the world, if we have caused suffering and disaster, if we have caused pain, if we have not remedied it, then our hearts will weigh heavy in the, in the scales. And, and so what is coming across in this scene is the advice to live life well and live it generously live it in a nurturing way, because the, the, ultimately there will be a price to pay uh, if, we, if we do not do so. And to learn from our mistakes and to integrate those learning into, into the behavior that we have towards others. Osiris sits in judgment at the end. It's interesting that this is the psychedelic uh, blue lotus uh, that we see here uh, in front of him. And this is Amit, the eater of the dead, who um, certain, certain souls are have so wasted the gift of life, have so abused the extraordinary gift that the universe gave us of life, that they don't go on to another incarnation, and that they are, they, that's what Amit Singh signifies. He's the eater of the dead, annihilation, the end of certain stories. Um, there's the, the specific close upon the weighing of the heart, um, and it's not only uh, a, a judging or testing of, of actions, but it's called weighing of words. And some kind of gnosis is implied in this. And this is where we start to get an intersection with the later Gnostic and Hermetic literature that I'm going to talk about in a moment. Some kind of knowledge, not book learning. They don't care whether you spend your life studying books or not. The question is, did you get it? Did you get the mystery that you were here to solve? Did you get it? Did you understand what life was about? Or did you pass through your life in just a sleep? Did you at some point wake up and start asking questions? Did you get it? That's what Gnosis is. It's a revelation. It's a, it's a, it's, it, 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 it's a revelation that is referred to. Not, it's revealed knowledge, not book learning. And I'm reminded of this passage in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, Meditation, Love, Ethics. None of these alone can bring about enlightenment without, without wisdom. Um, and there's uh, Amit again, the Eater of Souls. And this is what happens if you are justified. It might involve many incarnations, but ultimately the deceased asks Stoth, the god of wisdom, um, the god of writing, uh, how long am I to live? And Thoth replies, thou art for millions of years, a period of life of millions of years. And there's this moment, beautifully depicted here in the tomb of Thutmosis, the third at the uh, of the Kings. It involves a feathered serpent, interestingly enough, the Osiris figure, and the soul rising up into the stars. And symbolically, um, yes, that, I understand that that can be taken as, a, as an ancient alien thing, um, but symbolically, 
what it meant was the, the ultimate aspiration of the soul was to be reincarnated, to be reborn as a star, uh, and to shed light and life throughout the universe, um, in, in, uh, and on the scale of millions and billions of years, not of the little short lifetime of a, of a human being. So from the ancient Egyptians, the sun and the stars were all conscious objects. They were not dead matter in the way that we view them in our society today. Uh, and it's clear that in their inquiries into the mystery of death, the ancient Egyptians were using visionary aids. And I would highly recommend the work of William Emberden um, from Cornell, from California State University, who's done very serious study of this. It, I don't like the word narcotic plants in the title of this book, because these are not narcotics. Uh, although he has shown that they, the ancient Egyptians did use opium as a visionary as a visionary aid, they use the opium poppy. Uh, but the blue water lily uh, is particularly figured in ancient Egyptian iconography uh, and turns out to have hallucinogenic properties. And um, also, and this idea was given to me by uh, Dennis McKenna, the brother of Ten Terence McKenna, um, if we look at the ancient Egyptian tree of life, on which, when you're justified in the judgment, your name is written by the god Thoth, uh, we discover that the tree of life is Acacia nilotica. Uh, and that is a tree which is rich in dimethyltryptamine, in DMT. Uh, and it would not be, uh, it's not far fetched to imagine that the ancient Egyptians could have found a way to extract DMT from the bark of Acacia nilotica. Uh, since they were masters of chemistry, I mean, we get the word chemistry from our chemist, which is the, the, the chemist, the old name for, for ancient Egypt, but indeed the, the word art as well. Um, I think they were using these, these visionary plants. Now, when Egypt was brought to an end, and it was brought to an end at a quite a specific time, it, it lasted a very long time, and it went through the, the, the Greeks, of course, occupied Egypt. That's the Ptolemaic period. The, but the Egyptians colonized the Greek mind. Uh, the Greeks became Egyptians. They didn't detract from Egypt at all. They just, they, they were actually, it was a sort of, they were physically present, but it was the Egyptian mental state that colonized the Greeks at that point. The Romans, it was a rather different story. The Romans also uh, absorbed many Egyptian ideas. And I think had it just been Rome, it would have been okay. But the problem was, it wasn't just Rome. The problem was when the literalist faction of Christianity that became the Roman Catholic Church became the state religion of Rome in the time of Constantine. That's when things started to go wrong for Egypt. That's when uh, intolerant, fanatical Christian mobs began to run riot in Egypt and to destroy the temples and to persecute the priests. Um, and they did so because then... Christianity, in the form of the Roman Catholic Church, had become the state religion of Rome. They did so with the power of Rome behind them. This was the terrible brew that brought that brought an end to ancient Egypt. And the story of, that's told of Constantine's conversion. He was one of those horrendous Roman emperors who did, you know, just terrible things to people, um, including poaching his wife alive in steam. Um, or boiling her alive in a bath, depending on which account you follow. Uh, he, he, his soul was weighing very heavy as he reached his later years. And of course, there are many stories of his conversion, but this, this story is particularly resonant, that he, went, that he went around the various religions in Rome and said, you know, can you fix this for me? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm not going to live forever, and I, I want a good afterlife. And they all said, no, sorry. You know, we can't do anything for you. You've been too, just too hideously bad. But the, the, the faction of Christianity that became the Roman Catholic Church, who were also present in Rome, they said, we can sort them out. And um, that is part of the reason that uh, Christianity became the state religion of Rome. At any rate, as we're going through this tr transition into Greek-Roman times, beginning of fanatical Christianity, two bodies of texts emerge. One of them are the Hermetic texts, the Greeks called the Egyptian wisdom god Thoth, they called him Hermes. The Romans called him Mercury. The Hermetic texts. And the other are the Gnostic texts. And these texts are written primarily in Latin and Greek. 
uh, and they express, as far as I'm concerned, and I went into this in enormous depth in my book, Talisman, now called The Master Game. All the references are there. Whole sky ground, religion, everything is present. Um, they express ancient Egyptian ideas in the new way that is going to be necessary in the new age that is coming. They take it out of the symbolic language, they put it into another kind of language. And as indeed in the ancient Egyptian religion itself, the ideas that the Hermetics and the Gnostics express are extremely dualistic. We wouldn't know about the Gnostic texts at all, um, except the only way we knew about the Gnostic texts until 1945 was through the words of those who persecuted the Gnostics in the early centuries of the Christian era, the Heresiarchs. They, they persecuted the Gnostics and they burned the Gnostics at the stake and they told us what the Gnostics believed, but in a very perverted way. Because Victor writes history, and uh, a very bad idea was given of Gnosticism by those Christians who persecuted them. The Gnostics regarded themselves as Christians, by the way. They, they, they uh, saw Christ as a great Gnostic teacher. Um, fortunately, at the time of the persecution, an entire library of Gnostic texts was buried in a huge earthenware jar uh, at Nag Hammadi in Upper Egypt, uh, very near where you will now find the Temple of Dendera, and, uh, which was still functioning at that time. And they, they buried uh, their texts there, and those texts were rediscovered in 1945 by an Egyptian peasant family. Uh, and and uh, as the story goes, the mother of the peasant who found the text actually used the first two codices as kindling in her fire. Um, but then the family said, hang on, these might be viable. And they started leaking them out onto the black market, and uh, the, the rest of the texts were preserved in that way. And eventually, scholars got to work, and they bought up all the texts and compiled them back into what is now called the Nakamani Library. And anybody can read it in English. Um, the translation, the editing is by James and, and Robertson. There are many translators. These are amazing texts. I, I mean, they're not easy to read at all and they, they have very complex language, but I would highly recommend any, anybody who is pursuing uh, the mysteries to read the Gnostic texts. They're just fundamental reading uh, in, this, in this area. And as I've drawn up on the screen there, this idea is a coherent system that are characterized by an absolutely negative view of the visible world and its creator, and the assumption of a divine spark in man, his inner self, which had become enclosed within the material body as a result of a tragic event in the pre-cosmic world from which it, typographical error, from which it can only escape to its divine origin by means of the saving gnosis. And uh, so this is the Gnostic view of the, the Gnostic duality, that there's the spiritual realm and there's the material realm. And they kind of touch at the edges, but they don't interconnect. In the Gnostic view, all matter is evil, only spirit is good. Um, and the world of matter is the world of darkness and wickedness. Uh, our true essence was purely spiritual. But as a result of this cosmic accident, which involves that the aeons are the, if you like, the divinities of the Gnostic system. And one of them, Sophia, falls into matter. That is the, the idea of the cosmic accident. It's never really explained why Sophia has this fall. And in her fall, in her, in her terror, in her confusion, she creates a thing called the Demiurge. And the Demiurge in turn creates the earth, and he creates mankind, and he creates archons, who are the evil angels who are to keep mankind in place. But Sophia takes pity on this creation, and she inserts a spark of divinity into mankind. And that spark of divinity can be freed through gnosis, through revealed knowledge. The moment you get it, you understand what's going on on this prison planet. Um, you, you can begin to escape from it. And this is why the Gnostics were burnt at the stake. Because in their scheme of things, the Demiurge is Yahweh. He is the God that we have been taught. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam all worship that God. Um, they see him, as I said on the bus, as, as a kind of demon who has conned us into believing that he is God and conned us into acting 
out uh, his horrors and fantasies. And that's why if we read particularly the Old Testament, he is a, a jealous God, an envious God, a cruel God, instructs the destruction of nations, um, the very violent, violent creature, that horrible game that he plays with Abraham and Isaac, you know, go kill your son, you know, sac go sacrifice your son to me. I mean, what, what, kind, of, what kind of God actually would do that? Uh, and then at the last minute, reprieves and sends the ram to be sacrificed instead. So from the Gnostic point of view, this demiurge um, is, is the author of, of all the troubles in the world. And what we need to do is nourish this divine spark in ourselves and, and uh, resist the controlling power of the archons who often take human form and mingle with us and, and mislead us, uh, take us down the wrong track, keep, keep us locked in matter, imprisoned in matter, never to realize the spiritual part of ourselves. Uh, but it's very important to emphasize that the Gnostics had a high reverence for Christ. And they did regard themselves as Christians. And, and they were the first Christians, as a matter of fact. And for them, Christ was a great Gnostic teacher. And he wasn't physically, could not be physical. Uh, because physical is evil. He was more like in the form of a vision or an apparition. And, and they regarded it as absurd, that th this notion that he died for our sins. Because... We have to be responsible for our own sins. Uh, we can't hand that. We can't hand. We can't torture this God Man on a, on a cross and, and make all our sins okay. We have to. We have to take responsibility for our sins. We have to actually know good and evil and make and make choices. We can't just devolve that onto onto Christ. So for for, for for they took a very different view of who or what Christ was. But they did regard themselves as Christians. They were one of many factions of Christianity that existed in the Roman Empire at that time. It just happened that another of those factions were extreme literalists and they became the Roman Catholic Church. So the Gnostic story of the Garden of Eden, um, what is the tree? The tree is the knowledge of good and evil. And, and uh, the Gnostics turn this whole story upside down. They see the serpent as the good guy. The serpent is telling Adam and Eve, you need to know good and evil. You can't just exist in this, in this um, state of ignorant bliss. You have, to, you have to know good and evil. If you are to free the divine spark in yourself, you're going to free it through the, through the revelation of knowledge and through the, through the choices that you make. So quite the opposite of how we find it in the, in the biblical text, the, in the Garden of Eden, the serpent is the good guy for the Gnostics. And we know what happens in the Garden of Eden, that, that Adam and Eve eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And uh, the Demiurge, as the Gnostics see it, or God, according to the monotheistic faith, drives them out of the Garden of Eden. And the, the very humiliating uh, scene, you know, sort of being beaten on the bottom by angels here. Naughty, <laughs> naughty <laughs> attitude. Go away. Go and suffer forever. How dare you? How dare you? seek knowledge of good and evil. Goodness knows, next thing you'll be doing, you'll be looking for the tree of life. Yes. And then, you may become gods, like us. That's the weird thing in Genesis. You may become gods, like us. Who are us? What is, what is going on here in these, in these texts? 1291 AD, Gnostics were not completely wiped out. They did survive in various forms. And in Gnostic churches, we see what the tree of life is. It's a psychedelic mushroom. It's Amanita muscaria, used in shamanic traditions all over the world for thousands and thousands of years. Probably was the Soma of the Vedas uh, here in India. The flood, the Gnostics take a different view of that as well. It wasn't inflicted to punish evil. But it was to punish humanity for having risen so high to take the light, the gnosis that was growing among men. And what the flood did was it threw our ancestors into great distraction and into a life of toil so that mankind might be occupied by worldly affairs and might not have the opportunity of being devoted to the Holy Spirit. The more we're distracted by worldly affairs, the less we can focus on the spiritual divine spark in ourselves. And throughout history, those who sought the liberating gnosis this is just a fact. Those who sought the light, <coughs> knowledge of the true nature of things, have been persecuted. Right back, at the time of the Roman Empire, the 
the persecution of the Gnostics, the burnings of the stake that took place then, the horrible, horrible persecutions. And you can trace the survivors of those Gnostic sects from the Middle East, from Egypt and, 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 and from uh, Lebanon and, and, and Palestine. You can, you can trace the survivors of those Gnostic sects, uh, the Polisians, the, 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 the Bogomils in, uh, in Bulgaria. You know the word bugger? Yeah. Yeah, that's what it comes from, Bogomil. Part of church propaganda against the Bogomils. They said the Bogomils were all homosexuals, you know, having sodomistic sex with one another. So they, they called them buggers from Bogomils. That's where the word, the word comes from. Pure propaganda uh, of the Roman Catholic Church. And up into northern Italy and a stronghold at one time in northern France, but the greatest stronghold of Gnosticism into the Middle Ages was the Cathars in Occitania, the area called Languedoc in southwest France. Um, and there, in the 11, 10, late 1000s, 1100s, 1200s, emerges a fully fledged Gnostic form of Christianity, uh, which, is, which is incredibly beautiful uh, in many, many ways. And again, um, chapter and verse on on uh, the Cathars will be found in my book, Talisman, um, The Master Game, as it's now called. They were the first paper makers. They believed in the equality of the sexes. They believed that in universal literacy. They went around teaching, teaching literacy. They were vegetarians. Um, they were a peace-loving, highly enlightened community. The troubadours that we've all heard of, they came from Occitania originally with those great love poems or songs. It, it was like a, I don't know, it was like a tremendous awakening of the human spirit took place in Occitania. Um, and, and it held true for, 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 for about 200 years. But their mistake, or it's not their mistake, it was their belief, was that the Pope was the agent of the devil on earth. And you didn't get away with that in the Middle Ages. And the Pope declared a crusade against the Cathars. And this horrendous army came down out of northern France and descended on, uh, on the Languedoc. And a terrible ethnic cleansing took place, terrible genocide took place. Uh, and whole cities were sacked and, and, and destroyed and, and Cathars burnt at the stake and, and their, their books and their literature everything was burnt. This, this is when the Inquisition really came into its own. The Inquisition was, was created to destroy the capital. Um, and and uh, it's truly, I mean, it's just truly a horror story. And finally, Catharism is stamped out. Uh, and, and the Roman Catholic Church uh, prevails with its dogma, keeping us in ignorance, refusing to allow people to read and write, uh, keeping the sexes unequal, uh, everything the opposite of what the Cathars did. And from the Gnostic point of view, this was the work of the Demiurge and his archons. Uh, and, and indeed, the Demiurge and his archons and their human servants are always trying to steal the light and are certainly doing so today. So from the Gnostic point of view, if, as we all sense, the light is growing amongst mankind today, then we can also be sure that there are tremendous archonic forces at work in our society. Uh, and if this scenario were correct, and I, I don't mean to cause offense to those who adhere to the three mainstream religions, but if this Gnostic scenario were correct, then how might we expect these forces to manifest? And I have to say honestly that this is one of the ways that they will manifest in the priests, the rabbis, and the mullahs of the three mainstream religions who impose themselves as intermediaries between us and the divine. Um, and... and have the temerity to say, by and large, that we must experience our connection with the divinity through them. And all too often that connection is by rote, uh, by ritual, by repetition, not a direct revealed experience of the divine spirit. Um, all of the troubles in the world, if we go back, if we go back to the 12th and 13th, the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries, the Crusades, the holy wars of Islam, um, the, the, the horrendous persecution of, of Native American peoples, all justified by the ethic of these, of these religions. And uh, I, think, 
think it's not even controversial to say that, that, that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, with their competition for the so-called Holy Land, um, with, the, with the, the engine of turmoil and, and, and hatred and mistrust and suspicion that the Holy Land has become, um, are the source of, of many of the crises uh, in the world today. And they need to fix this, you know. Um, and may, maybe they will, from the Gnostic point of view, they'll never fix it because that's what they're intended to do. They're intended to stir up turmoil, hatred, fear, and suspicion. Um, the, the burnings at the stake, I mean, went on until the 1700s. It's just not that long ago. We <coughs> had the, the whole scandal of the pedophile priests in, in the Roman Catholic Church and, and then the stoning to death of, of innocent women in Islam. All done in the name of God. I mean, what kind of God authorizes that? And I don't think that the religions can be absolved of responsibility and we can just say this is bad people. Personally, I don't think that. I think that religions are responsible for this. And they should step up and take that responsibility. Uh, because that's the only way to change it. The state is another iconic influence, which again seeks to persuade us not to be responsible for ourselves, but to hand over our responsibility responsibility to higher powers, <laughs> along with our taxes. Um, and states multiply fear and hatred and suspicion, as we're seeing uh, going on right now around Ukraine, um, with the competition between America and the Soviet Union, or, well, Russia, effectively, uh, focused, on, focused on, the, on, on the Ukraine. And, and actually, that's a damn dangerous situation that's happening in Ukraine right now. I don't know, I don't know where it's going to go to, or where it's going to play out. Uh, but ultimately, these are states that, um, that control nuclear weapons. Uh, so does Israel, so does Pakistan have nuclear weapons, so does, so does India. I, I mean, you know, we need not live in fear of geological cataclysms. The human race is perfectly capable of wiping itself out with this stupidity. And I can't help feeling that if we're to move forward and to grow, then we have to grow out of this state of mind, where, where the state and the big religions and the big corporations uh, dominate everything. That's the other thing that we've, we've seen in the last thousands of years is the growth of big corporations. All of these deny individuals sovereignty and, and responsibility. And so I would say in general that our society doesn't support, but it undermines those who seek to explore states of consciousness that are nurturing the spirit. And I think that's why we become a species with amnesia, that we have this global iconic culture that is lulling us into forgetfulness and that we're not awake and aware en masse. That the, 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 the controlling parts of our society want to keep us asleep and oblivious and divided from one another and never to recognize uh, human unity. So this brings me back to DMT, which is the active ingredient of uh, ayahuasca. And in our society, it is a serious criminal offense to possess, to possess DMT. Dimethyltryptamine uh, is a Schedule One drug in the United States, a Class A drug in the UK. You can go to prison for a very long time. Your home can be broken into. Your property can be confiscated. Your reputation can be ruined uh, for possession of this of this substance, which, nevertheless, is a natural brain hormone. Um, it is it is generated in the pineal gland, um, and I believe strongly that. The next step our society needs to take is to recognize adult sovereignty over consciousness as a fundamental human right. Uh, and, and adult sovereignty over consciousness includes the right to explore our consciousness using these powerful agents like the dimethyltryptamine. And that it says something about the kind of society we live in that our society hates and detests and seeks to control. Uh, these agents of consciousness transformation, particularly since our society is not against altering consciousness per se. On the contrary, uh, our society invests uh, billions and allows large companies to make billions from drugs that alter consciousness, like Ritalin or Prozac or, or, or Siroxan. Um, there is no objection to drugs that alter consciousness, the objection is only to the alteration of consciousness in a certain way. I mean, these are the biggest drug pushers on the planet. These are the, these are the institutions that are really making the big money out of drugs. Uh, and the unholy alliance between psychiatrists 
medical doctors and big pharma um, is, uh, is, is taking advantage of a situation where we've been taught to believe that we don't have the right to control our own health and our own bodies and our own mental state. Uh, that everything is, that every, day, every year new mental illnesses are being invented so that big pharma can make new pills to sell to us. And of course alcohol, um, hugely glamorized in our society. Why do we drink alcohol? Um, yes, I'd like to drink myself. I don't want to put alcohol down necessarily. I believe sovereign right to drink alcohol too. But we're not primarily drinking alcohol for the taste. Not primarily. We're drinking it for its effects on consciousness. You know, at the end of a stressful day, you have that glass of wine or that, that beer or several because it chills us out a bit. It, 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 it's a consciousness effect that these, the, the, this is a consciousness altering drug. Uh, and, and its health effects on our society are incredibly well known and they're devastating. Far more devastating than DMT or, or cannabis come to that. I mean, I mean alcohol is just a, a huge health, health problem in our society. But it's not illegal because the way it alters consciousness doesn't threaten the controlling powers of the status quo, coffee, Tea, Red Bull, they're all about altering consciousness. This is what our society values. It's the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness. That is the state that we're supposed to be in most of the time. That's the state that allows us to be productive and effective producers and consumers. And we are allowed little holidays from that. We are allowed to get blitzed out of our minds on a Friday night and have a hangover the next day. We are allowed to drink coffee. All of these things arguably make us more effective in the problem-solving state. And the problem-solving state is good for Wall Street, and it's good for commerce, and it's good for the more mundane aspects of science. Um, but we have been told that if we, you know, if we stick to this alert problem-solving mentality, and if we learn to despise and fear other states of consciousness and just focus on the alert problem, that somehow we will reach the promised land. And I think that, I think everybody has realized with the financial crises of the last years that that is not so. That the promise of the society based on an over-monopolistic dependence on the alert problem-solving state of consciousness has not come true. And actually, this society is imploding. And yes, the bankers can go on magically printing electronic money for a few more years or a few more decades, but sooner or later, I think we all realize the system is bust. It doesn't work. Uh, it's associated with grotesque uh, pollution of our planet, uh, the destruction of the env environment, the, the horrendous threat of nuclear weapons, which is a very real uh, and present threat in the world today. Uh, we can't even solve the problem of hunger on a global scale. What's so great about the alert problem-solving state of consciousness if it can't fix any of this? Maybe we're over-invested in that state of consciousness. Maybe we should, as a society, embrace other states of consciousness. Perhaps that would open us up to new ways of doing things. The Amazon jungle, the terrible, catastrophic destruction of the rainforest. Only a society that is completely insane could allow this to happen. This is the lungs of our planet. I mean, this is the home of biodiversity. What, what madness to turn it into soybean farms? How could we even allow a single further tree to be cut down if we were sane? But we're not sane. We're a demented society. And that's why horrors like the destruction of the Amazon occur. We can spend and raise endless billions of dollars for warfare. Not a problem. Press the fear button. Press the hatred button. Press the suspicion button. And the taxpayer will cough up endlessly to fund more instruments of warfare. But cough up to compensate the people of the Amazon, not to allow that jungle to be destroyed, nobody's prepared to do that. Uh, there was an attempt to do it for just a small bit of the Amazon recently, and nobody would produce the money, just a few hundred million dollars. So what I would say is, we're not going to move on to a new, we need a new state of consciousness, but we're not going to move on to it using the old state, which is laden down with these iconic constraints. And we're not going to find, we're not going to rediscover Gnosticism either. Uh, that is gone. That has had its day. Uh, we need to find a, a new way of doing things. And that's where I think it's important to recognize that although Gnosticism
Gnosticism has been gone for a long time, in unexpected places, we can still find and learn from a system of direct spiritual knowledge that taps into the same wellsprings and remains very much alive. And the Amazon jungle happens to be one of those places. And indeed, there are uh, uncontacted tribes in the Amazon who really don't even know that this uh, Western technological nightmare exists. Uh, and there are 150,000 different species of plants and trees in the Amazon of which indigenous shamans have extensive knowledge. And um, I was touched to be told this by shamans in the Amazon when I asked them what they thought the problem with technological society was. And they said, it's really simple. You've severed your connection with spirit. You need to reconnect with spirit. And, and you need to do it actually urgently. And they propose a remedy for this sickness. And that remedy is ayahuasca. And I'm not saying ayahuasca is a one-stop shop to cure all the ills of the world. But let's inquire into this a little bit. The active ingredient of ayahuasca is the MT. And it's found, for example, in these leaves called chacruna in the Amazon. Cicotria viridis is the name of the plant. And the DMT in Cicotria viridis, I think I've mentioned this already as we've been going along, is not orally active. You cannot drink it because of an enzyme called monoamine oxidase in the stomach that destroys DMT on contact. And this is where an amazing feat of ethnopharmacology has been performed, because the other ingredient of the ayahuasca brew, which is something that you do drink, is the ayahuasca vine. And the ayahuasca vine, while arguably not hallucinogenic itself, although some would disagree with that, um, contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, which switches off the monoamine oxidase in the stomach and allows the DMT in the leaves to become orally active when they're cooked together with the vine uh, in the ayahuasca brew. And that's what the ayahuasca brew looks like. And that's a horrible little cup that you're drinking. <laughs> um, because it's a vile tasting concoction, um, very shudderingly awful taste. Some people like it more than others, um, but it's a, it's a pretty tough thing to drink. And uh, it makes you vomit, gives you diarrhea. Uh. <laughs> well, I've had my 55 or so sessions. I'm going to continue drinking ayahuasca uh, because I feel that I still have much to learn from this amazing jungle teaching. Um, even though the lessons are sometimes painful and difficult. Uh, and. and um, the first lesson ayahuasca teaches is we're not our bodies. The, 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 yes, it, it gives you diarrhea. Yes, it makes you vomit. But don't be embarrassed by that. That's a cleansing. That's something that you need to do. Uh, and it's really what is happening at the level of consciousness that matters with ayahuasca. That it's a portal to enchanted realms. And this is the mystery of ayahuasca. Uh, the transpersonal experiences that people all over the world have when they drink ayahuasca. The sense of connection with an intelligence uh, is very powerful and very, very real. And when you've had that experience, it's difficult to accept the material of our brains. It feels more like you're entering into another field or another level of reality. And uh, here's the work of um, Robert Venosa on the right here, he passed away recently, unfortunately, he was a friend of mine. And uh, Alex Gray here, another great visionary artist whose work has been touched by ayahuasca. And the, the previous images that I was showing are the work of Pablo Amarillo, passed away in 2009, a great uh, ayahuasca shaman of the Amazon. Uh, and the, the message, one of those universals of the, of the brew, um, is, is about the sacred, magical, enchanted nature of all creation and the interdependence of material and spiritual realms. And here's Martina Hoffman's work. She's the the, the, the partner of, of Robert Venosa. Uh, again, another great visionary artist whose work has been um, profoundly affected by her long relationship with, with ayahuasca. Uh, and and um, the spirit of ayahuasca is most frequently encountered as a creative guide, as a healer, and as a modern teacher. Uh, and 
again, I got into trouble with Ted for speaking of Mother Ayahuasca. I did hedge it about with qualification. I did say I can't, not, I can't prove the reality status of this. Maybe it is just a figment of my imagination, but so many people, it's particularly strong amongst Westerners who drink ayahuasca, is the sense of an encounter with a, a powerful, transformatory, feminine spirit uh, who administers tough love which can include a powerful kick up the backside from time to time uh, if you don't get your behavior right. But that there is something feminine about the spirit. Not all cultures see ayahuasca as a female spirit. There are some in the Amazon who see the spirit of ayahuasca as men. Um, but this is the manifestation that we're She's a shapeshifter, uh, in my view. But, but what I personally believe to be the case is that something is happening in brain chemistry that is allowing those who drink ayahuasca to reap, to gain contact with another level of reality. And in that other re level of reality, we encounter this teaching spirit. There's a life review in ayahuasca. That's why many people uh, will be found crying during ayahuasca ceremonies, because you suddenly realize the pain and suffering that you have caused to others, which previously you had simply justified to yourself. And it's why ayahuasca is so effective at getting people off addictions to hard drugs, uh, drugs like heroin and uh, cocaine. Jack Mabit's uh, Takiwasi Clinic in Tarapoto in, in Peru is one place where drug addicts are being freed of harmful addictions with a month of ayahuasca sessions. Uh, very often freed of their addiction permanently uh, and without any withdrawal symptoms whatsoever. During the ceremonies, a, a revelation comes. They, they understand why they have this abusive, dependent relationship with that substance, and they are able to abandon the substance without, uh, without further problems. It's, it's a remarkable thing. Uh, Dr. Dr. Gabor Mate in Canada is another man who was doing amazing healing work with drug addicts with ayahuasca until the Canadian government stopped him on the grounds that ayahuasca is a drug. Um, really, I mean, you know, methadone is such an inferior way of dealing with heroin addiction when you have the trans personal transformation that, that ayahuasca can bring. In my own story, I, you all know it, I was addicted to cannabis for 24 years. Um, I, it was a central part of my life. I, I did graduate you know, to very strong varieties of skunk. I did uh, smoke, uh, stop smoking it on the advice of my children. <coughs> bad for the lungs, um, combustion products. I, I switched to a vaporizer, which is a great way to um, consume cannabis. <coughs> and, uh, my relationship with, with cannabis was a very long one. Uh, from the time of uh, Fingerprints of the Gods, I would say that I was stoned all day, 24 hours a day, at least all my, my waking hours. Um, I, when I wrote The Sign of the Seal, I only smoked cannabis on the evening and weekends, uh, when I, at times when I wasn't writing, but when I, when I, I, I never wrote and smoked. But with fingerprints, when I began to go on to a seven-day-a-week schedule of writing, I thought, why don't I try and smoke cannabis and see what happens? And I liked what happened. Uh, and I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods entirely under the influence of cannabis. Not a word was written without the York Stone. Um, and uh, this went on with my books. But gradually, it began to slow me down. I was, I was in this sort of blissful state, but maybe it wasn't so blissful. And as the years went by, you know, the, the happy face became a sad face, and I became, uh, I don't blame the herd, I blame my personality, my abusive, over-dependent, over-use of the herd. I was not treating it as a sacred plant, which is what I should have been doing. Uh, I was treating it as a kind of crutch for everything. My whole life revolved around cannabis. I became very jealous, very suspicious. I related to everybody with suspicion. And I was very, very bent out of shape. And uh, that's when I'd been receiving messages from ayahuasca for years that I needed to adjust my relationship with cannabis. Uh, but finally, in uh, October uh, 2011, over a series of five sessions in Brazil, uh, I, I don't believe in hell, by the way, but ayahuasca took me to a place that looks like Hieronymus Bosch's hell. And, um, and uh, seemed to say to me that I was very much on I had taken the wrong path, and that I needed to adjust that path. I needed to adjust it urgently. Uh, otherwise, um, I, I would not 
I, I was wasting the gift of life that I'd been given. It was like the Judgment Hall of Osiris. Everything about me was transparent and seen, and, and uh, the bending out of shape of my behavior in connection with cannabis had to stop, uh, and it had to stop there and then. And, uh, and it did. Uh, when I went back to England, I couldn't smoke cannabis anymore, uh, and so I am a personal testimony to the fact that ayahuasca is an effective anti-addiction agent, because if I'd been told two weeks before I went down to Brazil that I would not smoke cannabis again, I would have laughed. Because it was so central part of my life, I couldn't imagine a life without it. And now I've lived without, without cannabis um, for 2011, to, to, to more than two years. And, and um, my productivity as a writer has, has increased. I feared that I would lose my creativity. Quite the opposite has been the case. I've become much more much more creative. So I'm grateful to Ayahuasca for freeing me from that, uh, that addiction. Anyway, Ayahuasca isn't alone. It's part of shamanism. And shamanism is a system of ideas that is outside of our chronic control. And what is central to all shamanism is altered states of consciousness. They're the universal feature that's common to all shamanism. And in these altered states, it's very common for shamans to report encounters with intelligent supernatural entities who they construe as spirits. And they sometimes take human form, sometimes they take a form that's part animal, part human in appearance, like this fellow here, uh, which is called a therianthro, therion, wild beast, anthropos man, um, and all this bird man over here. Uh, and shamans, as they enter the trance state, frequently experience themselves transforming into animal or therianthropic form as they go into the spirit world to negotiate with the spirits. And so it's a mystery that many um, shamans are depicting what we would regard as UFOs uh, in their paintings. There's a UFO up there. Uh, and that the, what they report about their encounters with spirits are very similar to the encounters with aliens reported by tens of thousands of people in the West who believe they've been abducted by UFOs. Um, and I, I knew Pablo Amarillo, and I asked him specifically about this at the time when I was getting his permission to use his paintings on my book, Supernatural. And I said, why are you depicting flying saucers? Are these aliens? Are they bringing beings here from other planets? He said, no. He said, these are vehicles for moving in and out of the spirit world. And that kind of struck a chord with me. He wasn't denying the reality of the vehicles. They're very real vehicles to him. But he doesn't think that they're bringing beings here from other planets. He thinks they're bringing them in and out of the, from the spirit world into our reality and out again. And when a shaman talks about the spirit world, that's not so very different from a quantum physicist talking about a parallel universe or a parallel dimension. And I began to wonder, are we dealing in these encounters in the visionary state, are we dealing with uh, encounters with, with other dimensions? Um, they, again, with the depiction of, of the UFO and of, and of aliens in, in this shamanic art is, is very, very clear, this sense of a, of a wider universe to which, we're, to which we're connected. Characteristic flying saucer here, characteristic perianthro snake man here. Uh, it's fortunate that we have huge bodies of data on sh shamanism. And the, the classic work is Eliad's uh, big book on shamanism, which will give you chapter and verse on the phenomenology of shamanism all over the world. Um, the hugely detailed documentation. And we have hugely detailed documentation on the alien abduction phenomenon as well, from John Mack, um, who was killed by a, a car accident in London, David Jacobs, Bud Hopkins, and, and, and others. And what happened, what I did in my book Supernatural, was to take these two dossiers, the, the dossier of shamanism and the dossier of alien abductions, and put them side by side. And what I found was that at the phenomenological level, they're pretty much identical. They're, they're pretty much identical. Um, we have the archetype of the grey in our minds, but uh, very often, before the grey is seen, the UFO abductee will see an animal or a therianthrope. Um, 
Um, so Virginia Horton remembers talking with an intelligent gray deer, and she has the spooky feeling that there's a person inside this deer. Another sees a deer looking through a window. Another abductee like sees a wolf standing on the bed. And John Mack sums up, the aliens appear to be consonant shape-shifters, often appearing initially to the abductees as animals, owls, eagles, raccoons, and deer, are among the creatures the abductees have seen initially. So these are two very different, supposedly, domains. Western UFO abductees, shamanic encounters with spirits, but the domains seem to overlap. Um, shamans report being floated up into the sky, climbing threads or ropes of light. You can see illustrations of this from the sand rock art in South Africa. Um, and exactly the same phenomenology is found with UFO abductees. Those threads of light, UFO abductees experience them as well. Um, the sense of being floated up into the sky. There's specific references to entering a metal vehicle in the sand traditions from South Another metal, metal, metal vehicle, they call it wells of metal in the sky. Again, they're construing this through their cultural framework. In the West, we see it as a, as a flying vehicle in the, in, the, in the heavens. But the phenomenology is identical. Uh, abductions take place underwater and underground by spirits of shamans and abductions take place underwater and underground of modern UFO abductees uh, as well. I won't read everything that's on the screen there. The, the shamanic ordeal is the classic feature of shamanism, uh, that the shaman appear, experiences an assault by the spirits. A weird kind of surgery, the insertion of objects under the skin, of crystals into the brain, um, pain is, is suffered. There's a sense of being helpless and in the hands of these merciless spirits that are just cutting you to pieces. And, and of course, the surgery is a very common alien abduction experience. It's universal, actually. It's one of the most archetypal of the aspects of the alien <coughs> abduction experience. Here's things that implants, crystals even. Uh, and again, I, if you compare the phenomenology between the two different realms, I don't need to read all of this out, you can see that they're not different realms. They're the same. They seem to be the same realm, viewed in, viewed in different ways. Sex with spirits. Shamans are at it all the time with spirits. They have babies with spirits. They have babies in the spirit world. They go meet their babies in the spirit world. And you find that these are always having sex with aliens. And they have hybrid babies in the alien realm, and they go over there. So what's the difference between these two experiences? This is the Rupert Spirit Codex. Typical, this is 12th century, but this is typical DMT vision of eyes. Uh, eyes in the sky, uh, overhead, rather like these eyes in Alex Gray's painting that forms the cover of Rick Strassman's book on DMT, the spirit of the uh, And we see an, a, an impregnation taking place in connection with this celestial vehicle. Uh, and what do we see up here? We see mushrooms, and we see a little elf-like being. Um, again, I mean, the comparisons just go on and on and on. What's this about? Here's the Gelder, 1710. Baptism of Christ, what's this? Up in the sky in the baptism of Christ, or, or is it a shamanic initiation? Um, Maria Sabina is given a book by a spirit. She learns many things from the book, but she's not allowed to keep it. The same thing happens to Betty Hill. The same thing happens to <coughs> Betty Agnieszka. UFO abductees who are given books learn from them but are not allowed to keep them. And shamans and UFO abductees often return with a sense of mission. Fairies and elves, another domain, a third domain. So we've got aliens, we've got spirits. What about fairies and elves? What are they? And why do they have so much in common with aliens and spirits? And, and, and here I, I absolutely need to pay tribute to the work of Jacques Vallée, uh, who was the first researcher to observe the crossovers between fairy elf realms and alien realms. And his book, Passport to Magonia, published in 1969, uh, I, is highly recommended reading uh, on this subject. And what I did in Supernatural was just take the dossier forward from 1969. So fairies, like spirits, like aliens, are in the business of abduction. The fairy dance is the be this whirling, turning dance. If you touch it, you're taken into another world. You may spend 500 years there, even though you think you've just spent five hours. 
Um, and uh, fairies could be cruel, they tortured, they hurt human beings, they also were kind, they gave gifts, they gave healing powers, they had the power of flight, they used celestial vehicles. What's the difference with aliens <coughs> or spirits for that matter? Fairies abducted people underground just as aliens and spirits do. Um, their, their fairies appeared as uh, animals or as part animal, part human creatures. Fairy anthropes, classic creatures of vision. Melusine is a feared medieval fairy who abducts human babies. Uh, and indeed, the snake woman, the snake man, is a is a universal feature of, of art uh, all all around the world. Uh, and the fairy anthrope just goes back and back and back. Which it, let's 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 be clear: shamans in the Amazon are painting creatures that are part human and part animal in form. What is Theseus? And the minotaur, what is the minotaur but an animal that is part human, a bull man? A bull man in a cat wrestling with a lion, 1800 BC. Uh, all of the Egyptian gods are therianthropes, classic creatures of vision. You don't see these things in everyday life, you do see them in the visionary state. Creatures that are part animal, part human. The oldest surviving cave painting in the world, from Mani Cave in Italy, is a therianthrope, horns of a bull, the body of a human being. Um, Hollenstein Stadel came in Germany, a lion man carved out of mammoth ivory. Bison men all over the painted caves, notably this figure in Chauvet. And the sorcerer from Trois Frères, which is a hybrid of many different theory. But David Lewis Williams is the guy who did the academic work on this over the last 30 years. And his academic work leaves us in no doubt that the specific imagery of cave art is unmistakably an imagery of visions. It is a vision, I imagery of altered states of consciousness. Um, and here are some of David's uh, very important books, particularly The Mind and the Cave, uh, which explore what is called the neuropsychological theory of cave art, and which draws a lot on research with hallucinogens and human volunteers in the 1950s and 60s before the war on drugs kicked in. Uh, and there you can see one of those volunteers on mescaline uh, drawing uh, a man in a modern business suit with the head of a fox. Uh, basically, essentially the same thing as the lion man or the bison man from the painted caves. Um, and if we were in any doubt that the painted caves are the result of visionary experiences, we find a, a recognizable species of psilocybin mushroom in the cell of Pasquale mural in the cave near the town of Villa di Villada, almost in Spain. Uh, which new scientists in 2011 trumpeted as the earliest evidence for magic mushroom root use in Europe. That evidence has been present in the art of the painted caves all along. So this is what I call six million years of boredom. This is the uh, ascent of man from the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee. And it really is a long, boring story. Two and a half million years ago, we start making the first stone tool. Once we start making them, we stick with them for the next million years without any change whatsoever. Our ancestors are incredibly rigid. When they introduce a change, the Acheulean, we stick with that for more than a million years. So we're passing down cultural information, but we aren't thinking laterally. There's no creative spark. And it's only after 100,000 years ago, really after 40,000 years ago, that you get this tremendous explosion of symbolism in the cave art, and the cave art itself bears witness to the fact that our ancestors were using visionary plants. Uh, this has been fought over by academics for the last 20 years. It is now the dominant theory of cave art. Uh, and it's not just the art. The whole uh, story of human experience changes. Uh, our, our hunting tactics, our stone tools, our spiritual ideas, everything take a huge step forward. It's the, it's, it's the single most important moment in the evolution of human behavior, and it's intimately connected to visionary experiences. There's a strong suggestion, uh, disputed, that uh, Crick was uh, using LSD. I mean, he did, we know Crick used LSD uh, very regularly, um, and he regarded it as something that enhanced his creative processes. Uh, but the, the, su the suggestion is that um, uh, that he told a colleague that he had first perceived the, the double helix shape while on LSD. That is, that is not something that everybody accepts, but it's an interesting sidebar. We certainly know that Jobs and Wozniak would not have created the Apple computer 
without LSD. Uh, and uh, the whole creative outburst nipped in the bud of the 1960s and 1970s uh, is uh, of greatest interest. What I'm getting at is that these substances are not just brain candy. They cannot just be dismissed as, um, you know, chemical fun. These are, in the right hands, used responsibly with respect. I, I'm, not, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to push or to advocate psychedelics, but what I'm saying is that the psychedelics used right uh, are an inalienable part of the human heritage. They have been part of the transformation of our ancestors. And we as a society, by demonizing those substances, are probably making uh, an absolutely massive error. And just as our ancestors got locked into patterns of behavior, we are locked into a pattern of behavior today, which is most unhelpful. Nevertheless, new research is being done. We're beginning to get research done on the therapeutic benefits of psychedelics, which which are beginning to open the door uh, to a wider exploration. What I'd like to see is more work like Rick Strassman's work. Uh, Rick is a friend of mine, a professor of psychology at the University of New Mexico, and the author of DMT, The Spirit Molecule. He got permission to work with DMT. He gave it by intravenous infusion uh, to a large number of volunteers during the 1990s. He was looking for a therapeutic outcome. What he discovered instead was something that challenged the very nature of reality. Uh, more than half of his volunteers reported experiences that are phenomenologically indistinguishable from the experiences of UFO abductees. They were not being physically abducted. They were lying on a hospital bed in the University of New Mexico. Rick was sitting beside them, but their consciousness was being abducted. And the kinds of experiences they, they reported, the probes, the, some of them met elves, some went to space stations, were just identical to the experiences of uh, UFO abductees. Um, the insects, the insectoid UFO is, is encountered, the probing, the, the alien laboratory waiting in, in space ready, ready, for, ready for us. Um, and the suggestion which several of the volunteers received that, um, that, they, that the entities encountered in the DMT state were pleased that the volunteers had discovered this technology. In fact, said to them, we're so glad you've discovered this technology, now we can communicate with you more easily. Um, what is going on here? You know, what is this all about? Uh, DMT is a natural brain hormone. We all have it in blood. You assay our blood, our plasma, our urine, our cerebrospinal fluid, and it's there. Why is it there? What's it doing? The research is more and more certain, there's recent work, work done with rats, which has really settled it, is that DMT is produced in the pineal gland, which has been seen as the third eye, as an instrument of consciousness since time immemorial. And uh, the pineal gland indeed is a sense organ in evolutionary older animals. It has a lens, a cornea, and a retina. In humans, it's descended deeper into the brain, but maybe DMT is its lens. Maybe. That's the explanation, because what Strassman proposed, and this is very annoying to nuts and bolts uh, UFO advocates, and what he proposed is that the UFO abduction experience is maybe explained by the spontaneous overproduction of DMT in certain individuals, about 2% of the population, that they enter this trance state and have these experiences, and it's really important that I would not be doing Rick justice if I then said, if I allowed you to think that he's suggesting that that means those experiences are not real. Rick actually does think the experiences are 100% real, but that we need to redefine our definition of what reality is. Uh, and that it comes back to this issue of the brain as a receiver rather than as a generator of consciousness, that maybe what DMT does is adjust the receiver wavelength of the brain. Once you accept that possibility, then it allows those experiences to be real. They're not normally accessible to our senses, but with the receiver wavelength of the brain adjusted, they become accessible. We're no longer tuned in to channel normal. We're tuned into all those other channels that are broadcasting at us. 
and, and Rick associates it with dark matter. Uh, these worlds usually invisible to us in our instruments and are not accessible using our normal state of consciousness. However, just as likely as the theory that these worlds exist only in our minds is that they are, in reality, outside us and pre-standing. If we simply change our brain's receiving abilities, we can comprehend and interact with them. And the very simple analogy that I always use to drive this point home um, is that uh, if we want to look at a star and we use our little telescope to do so, we first of all got to point it at the right bit of the sky, and then we're going to adjust the telescope. We're going to adjust the focus of the telescope. And while we do so, physical changes will take place inside the barrel of the telescope in the relationship between the lenses. And eventually the star will come into view. Well, see, with DMT, if you wire somebody up to an MRI scanner, you'll see physical changes taking place inside the brain. And what the materialist scientist says is the experiences that person is having are just those changes in his brain. They can be reduced to the changes in the brain, there's nothing else to it. But that's deeply illogical. That's like saying that the star that you see with the telescope is just the changes that take place inside the barrel <coughs> of the telescope. No, the changes that take place inside the barrel of the telescope allow you to see the star, which you couldn't see before. And the changes that take place in brain chemistry allow you to interact with another level of reality that is normally shut off to our senses. So who needs the Large Hadron Collider when we've got this secret doorway inside our minds through which we can make contact with other dimensions? At any rate, we can't see anything without interpreting it. That is the human condition. Interpretation is instant with any perception, and we interpret according to our culture. Uh, I would suggest that the phenomenology of these three supposedly different domains, aliens, spirits, and fairies, uh, what it is telling us is that we're looking at the same phenomenon. Whatever that phenomenon is, which remains open to debate, is the same phenomenon, and it's very long-lived, and it is connected. I don't deny that there are physical aspects to it, but it is connected to consciousness <coughs> at a deep and fundamental level. And from time to time, down the millennia, that experience has brought us the forbidden fruit of Gnosis. It appears to have wakened up our ancestors in the upper Paleolithic and turned them into modern humans. It's awakened us to the true nature of things. And that's why, to come back to the Garden of Eden, it's intriguing that in virtually every artistic rendition of the serpent, what do we find? We find a theriantra. The creature is part serpent and part human in form, a classic. Uh, entity of the visionary realm. And that brings me back to the Garden of Eden again, and, and the, the driving out of man, and the placing at the east of the Garden of Eden of cherubims, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way uh, of, the, of, of the tree of life. Maybe we're meant to find that tree of life. Um, maybe we have been diverted from our path, and uh, Maybe in this time of ultra-materialism and dependence on the technology that we live in today, we should consider re-embracing the visionary realms and uh, take that risk and see where it, where it leads us. So, thank you. I'm running out of breath and, and uh, we all need dinner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.